evening, everyone. I'm Lily. And uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about the story for Theros Beyond Death. Uh, which was honestly fantastic. You know what? They managed to not, I don't know, erase any character sexualities or anything like that because there was none. And um, that's cool. And by cool, I mean really disheartening and really takes me out of that set. Uh, so uh, instead we got a few paragraphs summary, just kind of dryly listing out what happens, which um, I gotta say, uh, personal opinion, this is going to be a hot take, isn't ideal. Uh, yeah, so I consider myself to be of the categories of magic players, four those above all the others. Uh, because I care about the story, I care about the lore, that's what got me into magic, was the story and the in-depth and whatnot. I honestly, one of the reasons that got me to check out magic was the fact that uh, that was about the time that, like, the Guild Wars Living World Season 3 uh, was going on, and that was just awful writing and whatnot. And not so much awful writing, but just, like, awful overall narrative design, um, I should say. And I was like, okay, let's look at other properties, because I've been following Guild Wars for years and years and years and years and years and years now since Guild Wars 1, and it's not so great, so I'm gonna check out some other stuff. And I was like, ooh, magic's cool, and magic actually has some really cool lore. Um, and they're in the situation where it's like, oh wow, the magic Sporthos has been declining for a while and now has uh, just crashed into the bottom of a ditch. Um, but theoretically we're getting out of it. It has been confirmed since then that uh, we are getting uh, new uh, stories for Ikoria. How good they'll be, that remains to be seen. Or what format it comes in. Or, I don't know, who is gonna get the short end of the stick this time for in terms of representation. Who knows? Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I will judge it when I see it. Um, uh, I mean, I think ideally I'd like to go back to like a, uh, in-house uh, web fiction because that was fantastic for like essentially cons through uh, do do do, like Ixalan, and that was just really great. They got a nice like flow of it, and it was really fantastic. Uh, but we don't have that. So today I'm going to be doing my set review for Theros Beyond Death in that vein, and that's where I'm going to be ranking every single legendary card, ranked by how much I want them. To, I wished that they had actual story, because this thing has this chock full of legendary creatures and. Having legendary creatures implies that there's like story that involves having named characters for, but uh, that there isn't. Um, also, I've included here the sagas because those are literally stories. This is a set which later has a card type which is all about stories that didn't have any story. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, Wizards, I'm begging you, please, just let the Ikoria story be hopeful and give me hope that you're moving in the right direction when it comes to the story. I beg you, please. I want it to be good. It's something I actually like and enjoy, and I want the magic lore to be something I can get really invested in. Please. But let's just jump into this list, because there are a lot of legendary creatures in the set in uh, sagas. Uh, 42 in per exact. I didn't count the Planeswalker deck, Elspeth, and Ashiok because they have other cards in the set, so I didn't double up on those. Uh, so coming out at number 42 is, uh, oops, that's not how you do that, um, is Kiora Best the Sea God. And this is last because we actually already have the story. This is literally just referring to like an, a one of the story articles or stories um, from the original Theros. So uh, yeah, we actually already have this one. So uh, it's checked off. You only have 41 more stories to write, wizards. That's not that bad. Uh, yeah. Also, unrelated, because I'm not even talking about how gross this card is, because we don't talk about 
stats on these reviews. That's not what's important. What's important is when what how can you make a deck that makes you the most amount of disappointment that there was an actual any story content for the set. That's what you're looking to do. This is the uh, Vorthos like it's it's a nice like Vorthos like self uh, self punishment deck where uh, you play a deck and then you're sad. Uh, not because of the deck, but because um, of the State of the Fourth House content. And you'll also probably be sad because of the deck, because it's not going to be a great deck. Uh, right, so this next section are, like, legendary creatures and whatnot. They're just kind of there to, like, in the set to be like, oh, this is actually, like, in-world things, or, like, reference, like, tie-ins to real-world Greek mythology and stuff like that, which, like, it's okay that they don't need to have tie-ins. Uh, just because it's like, you, you don't need a whole story about like what Pelucranos is doing in the underworld. It's okay to just have Pelucranos here and being like, Hey, Pelucranos, remember him from Theros? He's uh, stomping around in the underworld and he's kind of getting away, maybe? Uh, it might show up, but it's like, A, I don't really care about Pelucranos. B, why is a Hydra in the underworld? I didn't realize that Hydras were like, when do you the world? Like, do all animals go to the underworld? Like, it seems like they do, which is weird, I guess. Because you're like, the fate in the underworld is like based on like your actions and your morality. And I always thought that Pydras were like animals. Why are we judging them based on like sentient beings things? Like, that's in discussion from their day. But it's like, yeah, hey, look, it's Pelucranos. And Pelucranos is the bottom because part of me is just like kind of sad that so much of the set has boiled down to. It's like, hey, remember this person from Montreal Theros? They're dead now, but maybe not. Who knows? Uh, yeah, but this is also interesting. It's just like creatures that are like fine, like Ephemia, the cacophony. It's just a harpy, it's just a legendary harpy. We don't need to know who this is. And like, obviously, it could be great to know who this is. Like, it could just show up as a character in the story and it'd be fine, sure. But nothing really says, like, oh, I, I don't feel like I'm missing anything from not having a like full story article about Ephemia. It's just fine. Uh, Acto Sand Scarred. It's the Achilles tie-in. We don't really need, like, a retelling of, like, the Trojan War, and, uh, that's not really what we need to be going on. Um, Arasta, the Endless Web. I don't like spiders, so that's why it's the bottom of the list. Uh, Delacos, Crafter of Wonders. Again, like, it'd be neat to, like, say, let go, like, here's this take on, uh, uh, what's the face? It's Icarus's dad. Uh, like, here's this, like, take on this character, and really we don't need to have a story talking about, like, what happened, let's retell it within the magic universe, which is, like, fine to do once in a while, but I don't feel like I'm missing it, because it's like, you know this guy, you actually get the gist of that story, so you don't really need it. Um, same thing with Illyrios Enraptured, uh, because A, we already get the gist of the story, and B, let's be honest, the story of Narcissa, uh, um, Narcissus is not interesting. It's really straightforward and boring. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I like the design of the card, but it's just like, I don't need this guy's story. It's, it's, there's not much going on. Uh, Atris, Oracle of Half-Truths, which is such a song we don't know nothing about. It's just like, apparently he is in the underworld, but we don't actually have any flavor text or really any flavor because besides he's a guy in the underworld. And he might show up, but who cares? <laughs> uh, Santa, Captain of the Pileys. I mean, I'm as... I'm as gay as the next lesbian. Uh, but honestly, Amazonians never... Like, the whole mythology of the Amazonians never really clicked with me. It always just ended up feeling like... Weird men fetishes fetishizing, like, buff women stuff and not actually, like, good, strong women with female representation. And with the state of current magic storytelling, I wouldn't trust them to do it well. So I'm not super big on them, and it's just like, they're just fine. They're fine. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, like, a lot of these, like, smaller, like, minor characters and stuff is that, like, even if they're not so important, like, they can actually be really good for, like, actually 
exploring the world. Like one of like the best, my favorite stories is the story about the Git Rock monster uh, from Shadows of Innistrad. And they could have easily just had the Git Rock monster being like, oh, it's this creepy frog. Um, and people would have been like, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's an Innistrad thing. It feels like an Innistrad. But they actually went the effort of like having this really great standalone story about just like self-contained about this village and how the Git Rock monster kind of like ensnare the village into kind of worshiping and feeding it. And it's really creepy and it's really great. I highly recommend you check out really all the Shadows of Innistrad because they're very good stories. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do with like Jace investing Avacyn and stuff, but it really gave you a great insight into like a like daily life and what life is like on Innistrad and kind of the weird things that were going on with the like Emrakul's approach and her effect on uh, Innistrad itself. So it's like, even if character doesn't really demand a story tie-in, it is really nice to like see that. Uh, next we have kind of the start of a few of the uh, sagas and really like these are kind of things like these like some of them are like make sense like are self-explanatory like the first Tyrone games it's like it's something about the Olympics or like the magic version of the Olympics and getting some amount of uh I don't know tie into like what is this about like what is like like what is the more significant part than the few lines of flavor text we have and uh yeah but, they, but that said I this is one where I get the gist of it and it isn't really important for understanding the rest of the story um but it could be a really nice insight into the actual culture of Theros um where just like a lot of these like saying the stage ones it's like yeah they're low on the list but they could all be like having a few of these world building ones would have been really nice to see or maybe just going more in depth of them if there was like I don't know an art book for Theros. What a concept. Hey, remember the art books? I have all of them. They're fantastic. And it's not like Theros doesn't already have like four sets worth of art. Like I understand kind of Eldraine, like he might be stretched then because you only have like one set worth of art, but like Theros, you, 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 uh, many people complain that we, we were on Theros for too long the first time around. Uh, oh, we have more than enough content to make an art book. That would have been nice. I love them. They're actually really great. Uh, same kind of thing with Melodomai's Prophecy. Like, this is a bit more vague, so it's like, yeah, maybe I actually, you know, like, figure out what's more going on with this. But, uh, again, it's just like, okay, here's this cool thing, or, um, but, um, what is this about? Because this one is just like, it doesn't actually give you any explanation. First time around games, it's the Olympics. It's easy tie-in. And this is just like, this is just some Sphinx's prophecy, and there's lots of different prophecies in Greek literature and Greek mythology and whatnot, so it's like not clear which, if this is a direct reference, besides it's like, oh, it is a prophecy. And having some kind of explanation of this is what that is. Because um, these don't benefit from the benefit of the Dominaria sagas, which were like, this is a saga directly referencing this thing that happened in the old lore. Uh, so it's like, you don't really have that benefit. And the Akroan War, it's just about some war. And, you know, again, same thing with kind of these, where it's like, yeah, you kind of get the gist. And it's like, it's about a war. It's getting, it's a cool depiction of a war um, in terms of like how things work and kind of has this betrayal stuff. And it's obviously the story of Troy. Uh, but yeah. All right, getting into the stuff that's like, okay, this is actually a little interesting. Like, specifically Kronos, Hounds of Atreos, I mean, it's a bit more pertinent to the actual story, but it is just kind of a background character. And like, I'm not feeling, like the fact that we don't see exactly what's happening to Kronos, it's just literally, it's just Cerebus. It's literally just Cerebus. Um, but it's like, to just stop people from escaping. So it's like, it's just kind of a set piece for the story, even if it is a bit more directly related to the story. Uh, Thrix, the sudden storm, uh, kind of like this, this one thing where it's, it's, the flavor text really hints at this like weird, like, like, okay, what is the current relationship with the gods and humanity, which is this really been this always contentious thing, well, not humanity, but like mortals, uh, which has been really this like interesting dynamic. And here's this specific guy who worshiped, who, a 
follower of Tasa, who was like part of that and just getting any amount of like, okay, what's going on with like Thos and the gods and the relation to other mortals and stuff like that. Because it's one of those things where it's most of the Thos stuff we got in the original Theros block was her tension with Kiora and not her tension with like the general popula populace. Uh, Eutropia, the twice favored. Um, again, this is just kind of like, here's a human who kind of like talks to like, who's some sort of like communes of various gods and stuff like that. and you know what, how, how does this affect, like, what is the human relationship with the gods during this? Which we just don't get. Like, we know in the story, like, there's a war breaking out between Heliod and literally everyone else, and how does that affect the actual mortals? We have, like, from some of the things with, like, the red board wipe, you're like, oh yes, when the gods will, mortals pay the highest price. And it's like, uh, okay, what's going on? What is the state of worship? Like, what is there like especially after since like the society saw a god die like how is that affecting the stuff and we also specifically know that from this that like the god's power come from mortals worship of them and all this other stuff where how is that affecting it and what's going on there so it's like the the connection to what's going on to the mortals which is the easiest thing for humans to relate to, fun fact, uh, what's going on with them? Nyx Lotus, um, which is an interesting thing to have to disappear because it's like, it's kind of like one of those throwaway things, but the thing is that, like, despite Black Lotus being kind of the very, like, the most famous card in Magic, there's actually, like, no lore on the lotuses, besides, like, they are a powerful mana source, and that is it. And getting something, like, even if it's, like, this isn't talking about the Black Lotus, but, or, like, but, like, okay, like, let's actually talk about this. Like, what does this mean in their culture? What does this mean to the different, like, uh, people? What does this mean to, like, mages and things like that? And kind of going in and, like, Okay, let's actually like have a little story that gives not not it's like do all lotuses, but like what about this specific one and kind of start building some kind of lore around one of those iconic imageries of magic, and uh, yeah, like the same thing kind of like it's, like it's like kind of the same thing with like the Moxen where it's like yeah we keep getting new Moxen but like besides being a power source there's really not any thing about them and it's like are they as coveted as they are like in paper and things like that or are they just kind of like oh they're just these common bobbles uh and same thing with Nyx Lotus. Next up we have Galia of the Endless Dance who's the satyr legend and really any sort of story about like what is going on with the satyrs like post Xenagos's fall because the satyrs went hard for Xenagos because Xenagos Zen was a satyr and uh how does like Xenagos's death affect Effect, uh, affect the like satyr population, how that like responds, and like uh, this is like clearly like going kind of like following that like same vein of the god of rebels and stuff like that, and how has that affected this? And the fact that like there's almost no reference to Xenagos in this set besides like oh yes, Heliod saw Xenagos die, and he's now worried about dying himself, and that is it. That is almost all reference to Xenagos in this set. Uh, which is kind of weird considering he was like, I don't know, one of the most important figures in the last set. So, so next up is a couple of these, which is Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath, Crocs of Titans of Death's Hunger, and The Binding of the Titans. The Titans really are kind of like a footnote in this, where it's like, oh look, we're introducing these new mythic guys that are these cool, these cool new mechanics, and oh, they're escaping the underworld. But they don't actually have anything to do with the story, really. Like, they're just kind of there. So, can we get any sort of information like who they are? Like, is this just kind of the idea of, like, the normal Greek titans, where it's like, oh, maybe they were just, like, these precursors to the gods, and the gods, like, overthrew them because they were being, I'm a titan, Rah. titans are bad. Um... Like, what's going on? Like, is the Titan of Eternal Fire, like, in the same echelon as these Titans? Or is that, like, a lesser Titan? Because it's, like, not a legendary Titan. Or is it, like, the Titan of Eternal Fire? Like, if it was made nowadays, would that have been a legendary? Like, it probably would have.
would have been if, like, is that a specific titan? And, uh, just, like, any sort of, like, even if they're not that more to the story, and they're kind of, like, setting up stuff for future Theros stuff, who are they? What is the lore? You have this thing about the Binding of the Titans. What happened? You didn't tell us. Who knows? Another big thing that happened in the actual story that we didn't talk about, it's like, oh, there's demigods now. What's up with that? Uh, who are they? What's their relationship to the gods? Like, how did they come about? What is their purpose, especially within this war of the gods? Like, did you know that one of the central parts of this that story was this war between the gods? That said, if you looked at the cards, you'd barely come across that there's this huge war between the gods going on, because it's the cards are so focused on, like, we gotta get out of the underworld. When, like, that is just kind of like the backdrop, because it's like, oh, Erebus has been busy fighting, so he, like, the underworld's been getting leaky. And, yeah, so we just, like, have all these, like, demigods that are just like, okay, that's new. Um, I put the Triumph of Anax with Anax, because we don't know anything about Anax, and these are just, there's just two Anax cards, so, whatever. Uh, yeah, no, who are they? And hey, look, Timurit's back. Uh, why is he there? Ooh, who knows? He apparently kind of has an army and is, like, calling the dead, theoretically, for Erebos's army to, like, fight Heliod, but I don't know. Who knows? You'd be nice. Any about a story about these characters. Any at all. But no. No, they're just, they're just there. They're just set pieces. Eh. The Shadow Spear. Okay, so Elspeth pulled this out of her dream because the Ashiok kind of made the dreams more real because she was like giving her nightmares, so she like pulled it out of her dream and it was like this twisted reflection of Helion's spear, but it was like, it's like warped and stuff because she was having a nightmare about the Phyrexians because she has beef with the Phyrexians and like, is that real Phyrexian oil? Like, what is the association with this? Like, how does Elspeth feel the spear? Because this is a very clearly like Phyrexian style spear and you think Elspeth would be like kind of iffy about using sort of things and yeah, it's just like the explanation of the story was like very it's just like, yep, I have the spear now, I'm gonna say that nope, this is the real spear, even though anyone who looks at it is like, this does not look like the spear of Heliod, besides in shape. Uh and it goes about this because she just has this whole campaign about like, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna strip away Heliod's followers by like being like look at me, I'm cool, I guess I did what Thassa, or what Kiora did, and stole, like, Heliod's spear, except not from Thassa. Um, except mine's weird, and he still has his, but this one's the real one, trust me. So who knows? Like, it's just, like, kind of weird, and it isn't really well explained, and a proper story would have really helped talking about, like, what's going on with this thing? Oh, boy. And if they really change this into, like, oh, look, actually, since that was, like, dream Phyrexian oil, that works like normal Phyrexian oil. And guess what? Return to Return to Theros is gonna just gonna be like, oh, no, Phyrexians on Theros, no. I will be very displeased. And if we also then, if, like, Elspeth leaves with this spear, it's like, oh, no, she's gonna be leaking. And it's just gonna be Karn Situation 2.0. And that's just boring. I'm not gonna lie. Honestly, overall... 100%. I'm not huge on the Phyrexians. It's just like, fine. It's just like, okay, the Phyrexians are here. Like, it's, it's, the Phyrexians are not a compelling enemy to me. Because A, I don't like body horror, and it's just like, it just gets, pulls me out of it, because it's like, oh, no, I don't like the idea of, like, having my skin removed. That's not, not a pleasant thought that I want to go to, like, kind of like my escapist fantasy stuff. And, uh, yeah, no. And it's just like, it's like, oh, look, it's like the board, but worse. Like, a lot worse. Ooh. 
Phyraxians. They're not compelling enemies. I want an enemy that I can relate to. I don't relate to Elder Snore or any other Phyraxians. They're not personable antagonists. You know, like every other like major magic antagonist. Get some better antagonists, magic. <laughs> I so there's this war for the gods going on. What's going on with the other gods? Nyla, you're kind of boring. I'm not gonna lie. Sorry, but you're kind of boring, both mechanically and you're just like the god of the wilds or something. Who knows? Perforos, you know, you got the Jeb pose, and I'll commend you for that. But it's like, what's going on? He seems like he'd be down for some war. What's he doing during that war? How does that impact him and his followers and stuff like that? Who knows? We don't get to know. He's not even, like, hardly mentioned in the story summary besides that, but, like, the gods, collectively. Uh, Ashiok. Why is Ashiok, like, the cover face of this? She's, like, n or they have, like, no place in the story. Like, none. Like, uh, Ashiok's there and, like, gives else with some nightmares, and I was like, oh, cool, cool, Phyrexians, I'm gonna leave now. It has, like, no part in the actual story. It's like, Ashok's just this, like, narrative device that lets kind of Elspeth kind of escape, but not, it's just like, it's just, their, Ashok's place in the story is just an excuse to have Ashok there. And, uh, yeah, who knows what's going on. Uh-huh. No, but though that Ashok is the first planeswalk we've now seen that was do there during War of the Spark to actually show up in a main set. So, fun fact, because the uh, last one it's like Oko Grook and uh, the Kinriths, they weren't there, uh, and the two other two other like Elspeth has been dead and Calix was like not existing. Like, another thing this story doesn't do is, like, the summary doesn't do is, like, doesn't really give you a good sense of time of, like, how long this is taking. Like, is this over the course of, like, a few months or a few years or who knows? Like, when does it exactly take place? Is this taking place, like, immediately after War of the Spark or a little bit after? Or, like, where does Ash, like, at, presumably after because Ashiok's here, but yeah. Okay, we have Erebus next, just because kind of like the same reason the other guy's like, what's going on with him? Who knows? He's just kind of there. Uh, yeah. I mean, also just kind of like, I like the, the fact that we're usually like, Elizabeth, you can't leave. And also just like, what? I knew I made Heliod sit in time out. And he's like, okay, that's pretty cool. You can leave now. Which is like, eh. Like, it'd just be interesting to see, like, what's going on with him? What is his part in the war? And stuff like that, because clearly he had a lot of stuff going on. Um, how was this war even fair? Because it's like 14 v 1. Who knows? Uh, next up we have Thassa. Like, how does the theft of the Biden affect Thassa's worship? Like, there was a whole cult thinking that Kiora was Thassa. And also those stuff. And like, again, what was she doing? Like, what was going on? Any details about this war up between the gods that was going on would have been really nice. And you think would have been an important part. Um, yeah, no. It's a thing, I think one of the problems, though, is that like with the appending of the plot structure, that they're trying to squeeze in so much story into one set that they don't, the set doesn't reflect the actual story. Where it's... Uh, like, in this one, like, is this clearly kind of meant to be, like, kind of two sets where it's like, okay, the first set was this battle between, war between the gods, and, like, all this is going on because, like, Heliod's feeling insecure because it's like, oh no, what if I could die? Eh, so terrible. And I'm gonna kill everyone so no one can kill me, which is a really bad plan. Uh, and then the second set should be like, okay, let's actually, like, okay, while that was happening, guess what? Underworld's leaky. And, uh, let's see what's going on. Or, like, hints of the Underworld being leaky there. Um, same thing with, like, Eldraine. Like, Eldraine, the set, like, had nothing to do with the story. And it just felt so cram-packed because they were trying to establish, like, the realm and the wilds. And also squeeze in all these fairy tale references. And it left with, like, no references to the story or anything like that. And, uh, yeah. Gundam with the Demigods. Daxos, blessed by the sun. You know, 
Elspeth's ex, who she killed. Do they ever meet at some point? He's there because Heliod's like, yes, I need your help because reasons and also something that was like, what's going on? Like, how does Daxus feel towards Elspeth? And now that his like, memories are restored after being returned and stuff like that because it's like, last he knew, he was still kind of in and doing a thing with her and who knows but no we don't we don't actually get to see that because why would we care about emotions and feelings about characters that'd be dumb atheros the shroud veiled i think atheros shows uh here to stand in for every single one of the minor gods what is going on with them Okay, Atheros obviously kind of poor because he's there in the underworld. Like, I don't know, what's going on with Mogus and Iroas and Karametra, the best one, and uh, all these other ones, but they're just like, hey, hey, you get like one card where you're mentioned in flavor text and we'll push you goodbye now. You know where I get that you can't fit them all in the set and where like get references to all of them in the set, but you know where you could, I don't know, talked about them even if in passing a little bit more um if you had done like i don't know any sort of like in-depth stories talking about them and like i don't know like the people's relationships to these important figures on this world just a thought <sighs> taranika a crow and veteran hey look it's gideon Remember Gideon? What's going on with Gideon? What is his Wow. Like, A, who told the Theros, like, the people in Theros of Gideon's death? What's going on? Like, how was he seen? Like, uh, what? Because he didn't actually spend that much time on Theros after he died. Or after he, like, planes walked and stuff like that. Like, what's going on? Who built this place? Who did all this other stuff? Like, what is going on with Gideon? Like, we're in Theros, we're in his home, and he just, he's just dead. He died lately. What is going on? Like, you mentioned him. Like, like the fact that you directly mentioned him, it, like, confirmed that, like, people in Theros are aware of him and the fact that he died, and that implies, like, they also have this, like, veneration of him and all this, and it's like, What's going on there? And it was also just like so poorly handled in the actual like War of the Spark because it was like, oh yes, let's show him in the Theros afterlife with all his irregulars. And it was actually, no, that was just like kind of like a flashback or like moments before death. He didn't actually go to the underworld because then he might come back in this one. And, but we're going to put it on a card anyway because that's where we're telling the story through. Except when the story isn't on the card or like how... Gideon wasn't in the Theros Underworld, even though we showed that on a card. Or, I don't know, how Ilharg was there in War of the Spark, even though Ilharg was not there. It was just kind of talked about by the girl. Uh, is this that same situation where it's like, this doesn't actually happen, it's just kind of a reference, it doesn't actually happen lore? Because who knows? Because there's no story. Hi, I'm not mad, and increasingly mad, as I go through this. And I've gone through this several times already in preparation for this video. And, uh, wow. Oh boy. It's a great time to be a Vorthos. <laughs> the Birth of Leites. Sup. This might seem like a background story. Even sweet. A nice background world building story, probably featuring, I don't know. Caneos and Tear of Miletes, an interracial gay couple. You know what? That would have probably, I mean, it wouldn't have solved a lot of the issues, I think, but it would have got us started to, like, work back on some goodwill and, like, actual representation issues by wizards and lately and things they've done to their queer characters. But just kind of this, where it's like, Candy have, like, gotten, like, some references and they got a card and that was cool like that, but, like, some sort of story without them, like, talking about this and we have an actual thing about this. Also, the fact that the art is of Ifara, not the gay couple who found it and stuff like that. So it's like, that's, that's a, that's a thing. 
having it have. And a great, like, background thing. And, like, this does kind of fit into the saturation. You're like, this is just background information. It doesn't strictly require from the story. But uh, this list is what I want to see. And of all those, I want to see this one probably the most of, like, all the background kind of sagas. Because that's also one we don't really have the story about. It's just kind of, it's like, okay, we have the vague. It's like, okay, there was these two kings and they were, like, cool. And they're also, like, buddy buddy and there's some mythology since then back about like how they were like but really they were like mwah, 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 mwah. and uh let's get that story actual story fleshed out that would have been cool yeah Iliad yeah you know you're hearing about one of the major characters of the story who ends up like I guess getting punished or something like that with kind of like a whole like atlas kind of thing going on But uh, yeah, no, I don't know the fact that his kind of like mental breakdown kind of triggered this whole thing It would have been great like I don't know like a short like piece of web fiction like kind of like by like the old team like Cox talking about like this like this internal like uh, breakdown of Heliod as he like starts panicking like after this and like determines like he needs to take radical action like killing all the other gods and stuff like that and it would have been great to get inside his head or even if not his head like want some of his disciples around him as like he does this and like that reaction and how it relates to all this thing where it's like everything that happens in this story and the last one is this guy's fault and the amount of insight to his character and stuff like that would have been sweet. Wouldn't have been. That would have been great. Yeah. Yeah, would have. Whew. Elspeth conquers death. This saga is essentially, hey, you know what this card is? This is the card of the entire story of this set. The main focus of the set. We made it a card instead of making it a story. Rookie mistake. Putting this here is essentially saying that, like, hey, I wish the set had a story. So it's kind of cheap, and why it's not number one. Uh, but it could easily be number one, where it's like, I wish it had story at all. That would have been nice. Hey, look, it's Elspeth. Like, I don't know, the main character, theoretically. Except for the fact that there's this big, like, war of the gods going on. And I know people like Elspeth, but, like, there's other bigger things happening on this world. And yeah, she is the main character, and I get that, but like, there's a lot going on that isn't related to her story, but it's like, I don't know, this set is all about Elspeth and getting Elspeth back into the fray so that she can rejoin the main cast of characters. And let's be honest, probably take Gideon's spot on the Gatewatch. Um, like, let's be completely honest here. Um, yeah. Just like any amount of like just talking about her, like how this stuff is just, like because like so much of everything going on is like about her emotional responses to all these things that happens. Like her, she was being tortured psychologically with like the worst memories of like her growing up in on the Phyrexian occupied planet and like dealing with all this stuff, like dealing with like like the fall of New Phyrexia and like seeing all those other people rest die, like rest peace, Ven Venser, um, and cough and all those other people who died. Uh, but no, we just get a nice generic like, oh look, I'm a hero! 2D representation of who I am and not my internal thoughts because I'm actually a complex character that isn't just like a one-dimensional character of strong warrior lady. Yay! Number two, Glothis, God of Destiny. So we introduced a new god. We're not going to tell you anything about her. And, uh, yeah, also, she's the god of destiny, but we will feel have to specify that, she, really, destiny isn't really gruel, but she's gruel, and, like, how her ideology doesn't actually have to match, like, her color identity, because it's more about how she enforces it rather than her actual portfolio. And... Which, like, seems honestly kind of weird, because if that was the case, I feel like Heliod should be like Orzov, or mono black because that's how he acts and not in how he enforces his role because rather than being mono white necessarily but no it works with Colius and it would be nice to see that with through her character and the view of her followers and things like that rather than I don't know having to be told that in 
at Mark Rosewater's like Tumblr. It's just one of those things where it's like this is a clearly like very interesting like thing, especially when we're talking about like what is like for people getting into the story and getting the lore and things like like what is like the this this is a thing without story like gruel being destiny is this very weird thing and especially this very like predetermined destiny not like destiny in like a open sense of like claiming your potential and whatnot but very much like you are destined to do this you must do this and that doesn't seem cruel at all and yeah it's just some story to explain that would have been nice and finally number one we have calyx destiny's hand Planeswalkers are the face cards of Magic Gathering. They're the most, they are, it, it, the benefit of them is that they can plop them into a new world and be these connectable characters. And it is one of the best things that has happened to Magic storytelling, period. Uh, so let's introduce a new one and actually give us no personalization or character to them at all. And also be really confusing about like the circumstances of his like creation and his goals and his personality and his relation to other things and anything about him besides the very generic it's like he was created by Clothless and was sent after Elspeth and when Elspeth left he was like sad so he sparked that's all we know that's all we know we have no characterization we only get that few characterization on things like in supplemental products that don't normally have stories and it's like this guy who was in a standard set we have honestly less lore on and less personality than like the scene 18 planeswalkers it's like okay lord windgrace and sahili like yeah, they have some stuff, but it's like, we honestly got more of a lore, because they were pretty established, but we got more lore and story and personality from Animatu and Estrid than we got on Calyx. And that's just shameful, honestly, because it's like, these are the, this is one of the most important characters you're having. Um, also, I get why you need it for the color combination, but it's like, I can't imagine this could be coming up that much either, just because it's like, hey, his first showing isn't really gonna resonate with character players just because it a he's not that good b he's fine like he's like he's fine but um we have so many Celestia planeswalkers and let's be honest a Healy and that's Healy a uh, Huatli and a Johnny are way more popular so they'll probably show up more and yeah it's just the fact that we don't actually get characterization of this one who's supposed to be one of the main characters of this game we have no characterization even though he came through a standard set it's just really rough and uh yeah no like if anything else like that is what's important like yes elspeth it's a shame that we didn't really get characterization like her struggle and stuff but we already kind of know who elspeth is uh like ashiok Ashiok is supposed to be mysterious, so like not getting lots of like in-depth information, kind of like just like seeing them through like weird like weird angles and stuff and like preserving that mystery. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So like Ashok isn't the huge largest loss by not seeing them, but like this is a brand new character and you got nothing. <sighs> and that's it. I'd normally do like a witty thing being like, oh, now you can make a deck of all these characters and stuff like that. But it's just like... The lack of story is... I find this actually really pulls me out of the stuff, like the, the set, where it's just like, honestly, I don't care about Theros that much. It's just like, it's fine, but it's just, it feels so hollow just knowing that there isn't that extra layer of depth. And... Because like one of the important things when it comes to like world building and lore and stuff is that you want to dig one layer deeper than like the average or one step like further than average player will dig, and so you you want to like preserve that illusion that there is that more depth and really like I mean like I know it's like it's it's no with any franchise as large as like magic they're, they're, the the intern, the company doesn't gonna have everything figured out it's there's lots of people working on it and there's lots of changing all the time so it's like it is an infinite depth there isn't like a uh 
explanation for absolutely everything, and I understand that, but the depth has gone so shallow, and since that is something that really drew me to magic in the first place, especially over, like, it's just really, it's just really rough, or it's, it's, it's like, these are just like, okay, it's a cool design on, and name on a card, and that's it. Calyx is just a guy, and not even that, he's just like, okay, this is a cool character, and that's, that's it. And, uh, that's just really disappointing to me, and fingers crossed that Ikoria will change this, and it'll actually be good going forward, and we'll get, kind of bring this out, but, uh, this is a huge speed bump, and, I mean, that alone will make me not, I look upon Theros fondly at all, like, like, even since that I honestly didn't love things like Aether Revolt and stuff like that, it's like, I still look back on Aether Revolt fondly, because I really liked the story, things with, like, Hour of Devastation and Amonkhet, like, not my favorite formats, but they were so good, like, Ixalan, one of the worst draft formats in, like, recent years, had the best the magic story has honestly ever been, and it makes me just so excited if we ever go back to Ixalan, and, yeah, and you know, also part of it has just been disheartening that it's, it's also really shown kind of how in the minority a lot of the fourth those players are, and just how many players just don't care, like, at all, or, like, it doesn't even cross their mind, and, like, that's fine, but it is just, it is kind of sad just seeing, like, the segment of the player base that you're part of, and that Wizards officially recognizes, like, they've, they've earned, like, they, they coined Vorthos, that you're not significant enough to be catered to, uh, or just, like, get the bare minimum, and that sucks, and, uh, we'll have to see how it goes going forward. Uh, this is supposed to be a fun video, and it ended up being a real downer, but, uh, you know what? What do you do? Besides make uh, bitter videos about the lack of the thing that you got into the game for. Which, you know what? I'm valid. I know you don't normally say this to someone else, but you know what? I'm gonna say it myself. Uh, I'm just rambling now, aren't I? <laughs> well, either way. I mean, I really don't hope you didn't, like, I hope you found the video, I don't know, somewhat entertaining. Not necessarily enjoyed it, because, I don't know, I, I don't hope you, you take enjoyment and reveling in the mediocrity and death of the thing that I love in this game, but you know what, you do you, so, um, <laughs> but either way, I hope you have a wonderful night, and you have wonderful dreams, and as always, may your story smile upon you. <laughs>